والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم الذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل كل في فلك يسبحون ويخلق ما لا تعلمون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you This is Universal Quran Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalam ala Rasulullah. All praise belongs to Allah alone. We pray for His blessing and peace upon the Prophet Muhammad. This is Universal Quran where we study the Quran, its interpretation and explanation in the sciences of tafsir. We study as we can in the original language and explain the English meanings of the verses as well as the context in which these verses were revealed to better understand how to apply it in our own daily lives. The Quran is truly a universal book meant for guidance to all of mankind. In order for us to live our lives, though, we have to have a clear understanding of its message, its purposes, how we can ad adopt it in different phases, not only in beliefs, in rituals of worship, but in every aspect of our human interaction uh, as individuals and communities and families. So, to help us better understand the Qur'an, we're going to first uh, read some of the verses in the original Arabic. We'll have the English explanation, and we'll read some of the commentary and discussion of these verses from the early generations, the early scholars of Islam, uh, until the present day. Uh, currently, we're on the 30th section, the final section of the Holy Qur'an. Today, we're going to be uh, studying chapter 94, Al-Sharh. Uh, this is a chapter which is a continuation of the theme of the previous chapter, which is talking to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after he had endured uh, many years of persecution and suffering, uh, finally starting to achieve the success in the time of the Hijra to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ was in great danger after his uncle uh, Abu Talib passed away. His uncle provided protection to the Prophet from his enemies. And upon his passing away, the various clans in Mecca all gathered and agreed that each clan would send one of their young persons to murder the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he came out of his house uh, to go to his morning prayers when it was still dark before uh, the, the light of the morning. And so the Prophet was in grave danger. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned him of the plot and frustrated that plot. And it was with Allah's blessings that Islam was able to continue because of the hijra or the migration. And we'll talk more about that after we read the first verses of this beautiful chapter. I'm going to ask our brother Fayruz to read verses 1 through 4, please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي أنقض ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك Thank you. Bilal. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Have we not opened your breasts for you and removed from you your burden, which weighed down your back and raised high your fame? So these first verses are devoted to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically. So Allah is addressing him and reminding him of his blessings. The previous uh, chapter, chapter 93, ended when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet to proclaim the blessings of Allah upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَبِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ 
And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to proclaim these blessings. And this verse goes on and lists some of those blessings which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gave to his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the first verse, it means, uh, have we not expanded your heart or opened your heart? This is in direct relation with Allah saying in chapter 6, Al-An'am, in verse 125, Allah desires to guide, whom, whomsoever Allah desires to guide, He opens His heart to Islam. So it means that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires to guide any man or woman, He expands His heart with knowledge and understanding and wisdom of this religion so that we can embrace the religion of Islam and understand it and live it in our lives. But that was for every Muslim man or woman who is guided to the religion, uh, to the belief of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this verse is a particular verse. This verse is a specific thing about the Prophet Muhammad himself. And there was a specific thing which happened to him, which of course is narrated by Ibn Abbas, which was the Prophet was 10 years old when this incident happened. The people of Mecca used to be concerned that the city life wasn't good for the character of their children. They would pick up bad habits and also they would pick up the city language, which was not the pure Arabic language. So the people, the wealthy families and important families would send their children out to the desert to live with the Bedouin people where they would learn pure, uh, beautiful Arabic language and they would learn the uh, uh, strong character of the people of the desert. So the Prophet ﷺ was sent out there uh, and lived out in the desert with, uh, with the Bedouin people. And one day, as it's narrated by uh, Abu Huraira, uh, two angels came to him and opened up his chest and removed from it uh, a black thing, which was the envy and, and rancor and feeling of, uh, of anger that people have, any kind of evil that was in Side the heart of the Prophet وسلم, and replaced it with kindness and love and mercy and wisdom. And so that was the particular incident which is being referred to uh, in the opinion of Ibn Abbas, who was the cousin of the Prophet, وسلم, uh, who as a child the Prophet prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him the knowledge and understanding of this religion. And so he is the teacher of tafsir, of the explanation of the Quran for the Muslims. And did so, the angels use the uh, Zamzam water? Yeah, well, it, it purified his heart and washed it with Zamzam water. And there's, uh, there are different stories uh, about that. And another similar incident also happened on the Isra, the night in which the Prophet Sallallahu was uh, taken from Mecca in the last year before the pilgrimage, the year of grieving, when his uncle had died, his protector, Abu Talib, who was uh, caring for him and, and, you know, for most of his life. And his wife, Khadija, also passed away. And the Muslims were in their darkest period where they were weak and they were suffering and they were very near being, being defeated if not for the migration to Medina. And so uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the Prophet by taking him on a night journey to Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem, where he prayed with the other prophets. And also a similar thing happened to him at that night journey and he was raised up to heaven uh, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the veil of Allah. Uh, in any case, uh, Allah goes on and narrates other blessings to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, he said, and remove from you your burden. And specifically said, well, what burden? Which burden is that? That one which weighed down your back. You know, your back, you know, you're supported by your spine, your backbone, the strong part of your body. And under a burden, you can actually hear it crack and bend under that burden. And so it implies something that's very heavy that is weighing down on the strongest part of your body, the support of your body. And that is, the Prophet ﷺ was a respected man of his community. When he was 40 years of age, Allah gave him a great burden, which he had to go and talk to people about things they didn't want to hear. He had to criticize their religious beliefs. Where did they get their religious beliefs? They inherited them from their ancestors, whom they cherished. He had to criticize their customs and practices. All of those things the Prophet ﷺ had to tell them. And of course they were going to reject it and hate him after he had been a respected person. And it's a shock. Somebody you've known for 40 years and suddenly he comes with this mission and he's totally changed in his personality. Suddenly, before, before he was a private person, a normal person of the city, now he's out 
preaching to the people and telling them that your way is wrong and Allah is going to punish you. And so that was a great burden for him that was difficult. And he had to endure ridicule and, uh, and people were uh, displeased with him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him something which was better than that. And he said, and raise high your fame. This actually happened. And these verses were actually revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet asked, you know, previous Prophets had many great miracles. Some of them controlled and directed the winds. And others raised the dead back to life. And Allah is saying, well, didn't I give you all of these blessings also? And also we have to remember that these uh, verses were revealed in light of the hijra or the migration of the Prophet ﷺ. When at the darkest hour, Allah brought forth the people of Medina who were in need of somebody to settle their disputes. They used to fight with each other, the different tribes in Medina. The, the tribes would fight each other, the Aus and the Khazraj tribes. They had a history of warfare. And they wanted a just judge to judge between them. And they had been warned. They had been told there were Jewish community that was living in Medina at that time. And the Jewish community had said, we're expecting this prophet who is going to be sent by Allah. He's going to come to us and we will join and follow him and we will defeat you. So they said, well, we, this is the prophet. He's come. Let's join with him uh, before the Jewish people do and we will be on, the, on sort of the winning side. And they invited the Prophet ﷺ to come and to be the judge who would not be biased to either of the sides, but they could trust in his decision between, between them when they had disputes so they wouldn't go into warfare. They, they actually gave him a nickname for that the attribute he has. What was it? Um, a Sadiq? Or what, was it? what was the name? I'm not, I'm yes. not sure. Uh, yes, the, the, the truth-bearing. Um, uh, and so uh, the Prophet ﷺ was able to go to... Medina, the Muslims were able to migrate to Medina. Eventually what happened, the Prophet was given the command by Allah and told that the, the unbelievers were gathering to fight and kill him. And uh, he came out of his house at night. The assassins who were waiting outside of his door fell asleep. He actually put dust on their heads. He made the migration along with Abu Bakr. His uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib the son of his uncle, slept in his bed so people would think that he was still in that bed and he left on the migration. And that was the turning point in Islam where the Muslim community went from being the persecuted minority to being a model community, having a city that was run and established on the just laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was a turning point in Islam and this surah is full of that kind of... Uh, happiness and joy and good news to the Prophet wasallam. that even though he's enduring a great burden Allah is going to lift that from him and his fame his mention is going to be spread that everybody billion people in the world at all times and places people remember his name and ask Allah's blessing and peace be upon him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so the Prophet wasallam, even in the non-Muslim communities is a model of what a Prophet is supposed to be the Prophet Prophet par excellence, as they say, the best example of a prophet, of a strong personality, who was a religious leader, as well as the leader of a community, a lawgiver, a just ruler of the city. So we'll, this, this uh, surah is full of a lot of beautiful meaning. We'll come back to that. We're going to take a break. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> TV has taken another step towards delivering its very informative programs to a wider international audience. For the first time in an effort to bring our programming to Europe, Huda TV is now broadcasting on Hotbird. Our viewers can now watch Huda TV according to the following perimeters. Hotbird 8, 13 degrees east. Frequency, double one, five, double six. Polarization, horizontal. Symbol rate, two, seven, five, double zero. FEC, three over four. Huda TV, a light in every home.
Welcome back to Universal Quran. Uh, we're studying from chapter 94 of the Holy Quran, Ash-Sharh. In this chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet Muhammad that he has opened and expanded his heart. And literally, angels came and purified the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and removed uh, envy and, and anger and, and rancor from his heart and replaced it with mercy and kindness and knowledge and wisdom. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was a human being like all of us and he had the same human nature that all of us have. He wasn't a, a God or a son of God or a divine being. But he had a special favor from Allah that put him in a high level of character as Aisha uh, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, his wife said, كَانَ خُلْقُهُ Quran that he embodied the Qur'an in his character, in his behavior. And so this verse points out to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was given a blessing of kindness and gentleness and mercy and love for his fellow man that he exemplified in every aspect of his mission throughout his life. Uh, Allah said in the Qur'an, uh, If, O Muhammad, you had been... It was a mercy from Allah that you had dealt justly with them, meaning with the, the Muslim, the weak Muslim followers, his companions. For if you had been severe and hard-hearted, they would have fled from about you. This is in chapter 3, verse 159 of the Holy Quran in Ali Imran. Uh, in the time of war, in times of danger, when they were surrounded by enemies, and it was a very dangerous time, the Prophet ﷺ could count on his companions to support him and to stay with him no matter how hard and difficult things were because he had been so gentle and kind they were full of love of him not full of fear uh, fear of him and fear of his anger and fear of his wrath and his, his, um, his uh, uh, treating them in a harsh way and so the prophet exemplified the highest in characteristics also in chapter uh, 68 of the holy quran Al-Qalam, verse 4. O Muhammad, you are on the highest level of moral excellence, of the strength of character. Al-Khuluq means having a vision, a mental vision, a clear perception of yourself and what your job is in this world. What does Allah want you to do and how to exemplify it. And so it gives you a tranquility and peace of mind because you understand what your purpose in life is. You understand what Allah wants you to do and you can act toward people the way Allah desires because you're not confused about what your purpose in life is, what, what is right and what is wrong. And so the Prophet ﷺ had a clear insight into what the Qur'an was about. And he didn't just read these verses of the Qur'an to people and to preach to them and speak, but he lived it. And Yes, the Prophet ﷺ was on the highest level of moral excellence, but he is the model for all of us. So we have to, to the best of our ability, according to our strengths, according to our, each, each of us has, has a different level uh, of abilities and perceptions. We have to try to exemplify the message of Islam as much as we can in our lives and treat people in a way that will attract them to this religion, not drive them away. Like the Prophet in, in times of battle, he could count on his followers because they loved him, of sticking by him and not fleeing and leaving him exposed. All of us are like that. When we treat people in, with kindness and mercy and love, and we show them what we mean, instead of just talking about it, but show them in how we treat people, then we can count, inshallah, on unifying the community so that we can support one another and help one another. And that is the only way that we can survive and, inshallah, thrive in this world and make our, our message of Islam spread and make people attracted to it by our high level of character. I'm going to read now the final uh, three verses, five, or, yeah, um, starting from uh, five, verse five. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا 
فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانصَب وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَارْغَب So verily with hardship there is relief verily with hardship there is relief so when you have finished your occupation then devote yourself for Allah's worship and to your Lord alone turn your intentions and hopes so the early Muslim community under the leadership of the Prophet may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him endured hardship but this is like a principle of the Quran one of the fundamental principles that with every hardship every hardship is followed by a relief or an ease that this religion is not revealed to bring hardship to people it's not revealed to make things difficult for them but it's revealed to guide us to what is better for us for our welfare for what is best for us as individuals and families and a community so the religion of Islam is meant to be a guide to what is easy in life to make things better to improve them not to make things more difficult and hard so it's a principle of Islam that when you endure patiently uh, in times of difficulty that that's an act of worship and then after that will come ease that will make you forget inshallah the bad things that happened to you in the past and by doing that you show your thank thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your appreciation for your for for the benefits which have come so after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the muslims endured hard persecution for 13 years in mecca people were killed for their faith and they were tortured and they were forced to renounce their faith against their will and they lost their homes they lost their their worldly goods they were actually shut up in a canyon and blockaded there and boycotted so that nobody would trade them food nobody would trade them any goods till they were practically starving to death there in Mecca after that at the darkest hour came the hijra where the Muslims were able to migrate to the city of Medina and after the being weak now they became a majority community and they became a model community so the, the different Arab tribes sent their representatives to Medina and they examined and saw what kind of a civilization Islam could establish in that city when justice was practiced and fairness and people were given the freedom to worship their uh, their go their Lord and their God and they brought that news back to their communities so within a few years after this darkest hour within 10 years the whole of Arabia had joined the Islamic faith and the Muslims were able to go back practically without bloodshed and take back Mecca and destroy the idols and purify the city of Mecca and devote it only to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the pilgrimage and to the uh, worship at the holy shrine the mosque of Mecca uh, so Allah is telling the Prophet that this is a promise that if you're patient good things are going to happen in the end and of course Fat Mecca the opening of Mecca was the highlight of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that before he died he led all the Muslims in the final pilgrimage of his lifetime and was able to give them his message before his death sum up his message that Islam had been completed and perfected in this one generation that's a fantastic thing that Islam was as Allah said and revealed in that final uh, pilgrimage that this day I have completed your faith and your religion of Islam for you and accepted Islam as your religion uh, exactly what day was that? That was, of course, on, re revealed on the day of Arafat in the Hajj, in the final days of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So these are the major holidays in Islam. It's also on actually on Friday, and so Friday is the major weekly holiday, and of course the the Hajj, the major yearly annual uh, holy day in the religion of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa taala goes on here in the last verse, verse eight. وَإِلَّا رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ And to your Lord alone, turn all of your intentions or your hopes and desires to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After your work, after your struggle and difficulty, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship. After you're out uh, teaching, preaching, doing your work, whatever kind of struggles you have in your life, then you stand up to before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship. And also, after your worship, after your prayers, after you complete your required salat, you don't just necessarily jump up and, and move, but you stay in your place, mentioning the name of Allah, asking for forgiveness, uh, 
making dhikr or remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorifying His names, making dua and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, invoking Him and asking Him, supplicating Him for help. So even after we have performed our required salat, we don't rush out back into the world, back into the business that we have done, but we stay for a while and uh, perform the dhikr or the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is saying to the Prophet Wasallam, after you have finished your occupation, whether it's your worldly business or your act of worship, still then turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and devote worship to Him alone. This is a way of telling us basically of the message of Islam. The message of Islam is not simply rituals, but it involves the life outside that all of us have, as well as the life in the mosque or in our private prayers. And in all cases, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solely for worship and ask Him. And ask Allah only. Ask Him for what you need. Devote yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Don't hope for anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put your fear in Allah, then you won't have to fear from anybody else. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then you won't have to worry about somebody betraying you in the future or breaking their promises to you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't break your your purposes. So the break break his promises. So the real worship, the feeling in your heart that's called ibad or the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to devote every positive feeling in your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That doesn't mean of course that we don't trust in people or hope or hope that people will keep their promises to us. It means that we put ultimately everything in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we know that Every other thing, every cause and effect in this world, whether it's dealing with people or dealing with institutions or any situation in our life, those are the secondary effects. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His will alone primarily is what determines things. So we have to realize in our heart that no matter how disappointed I am in people, no matter how disappointed I am in my society, my community, and its institutions, that I can trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and after enduring patiently these hardships and difficulties that inshallah, God willing, we will have ease. So this verse, I think this chapter is a very beautiful chapter. It's a continuation of the meaning of the previous chapter about the blessings of Islam to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa himself. When we see Allah's compassion upon him, why did Allah have to send these verses to him? It was because he was a human being. He needed to be reassured. So that should be reassurance to all of us that Allah is easily able after we endure patiently to bring us back to a a, a good life with our patience, inshallah. So it's an inspiration to everyone. Uh, It's part of the universal message of the Holy Quran, not only for the Prophet Muhammad in his time, but for our time as well. That's all we have time for today. But I ask Allah to bless and guide all of you as well as myself. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون